Dr. Higgins, thanks for joining us. So glad, no so glad that you're part of this. Um, it's 531, uh, so I, I suggest that we, uh, we get started. Um, we have a, a good group of attendees here. Uh, right now it's 25 attendees. And uh, uh, just to explain to everybody, uh, this is a, a special Zoom, um, uh, a Zoom event where, where we can um, allow a lot of people to come in. Uh, we actually uh, upgraded our account to uh, provide for more, more uh, access so we can uh, have more people. Um, we are the, the way the evening is going to uh, go, we're going to start by first, um, I'm just going to give an overview of, of what, what tonight's uh, info session will be about. And um, we'll introduce uh, the, the action committee that we'll be working with. And then I'm going to turn it over uh, to uh, Dr. Uh, Greg Vincent, Dr. Roger Cleveland, and Dr. Roz Akins. And they're going to take us through the um, uh, how they're going to be working with Paducah schools um, in this racial equity initiative. And uh, so I'm really excited about our, our partnership here. Um, and uh, so at the end, uh, we're going to have time for questions, uh, which we'll do uh, through the chat box. The, the, if, when we get to the end, um, you can send a chat to all the panelists and we can address as many questions as, as we can here. Uh, tonight. So, uh, so again, the format tonight, pretty simple. Um, first, we're going to uh, just uh, talk through the, the committee. Uh, I'm actually going to uh, put up a, uh, I'm going to share my screen so people can see here. Uh, and actually, we have a lot of uh, committee members on this call, but this is the Paducah Schools Racial Equity Initiative Action Committee members. Um, we um, actually got some input uh, from uh, Dr. Vincent and Dr. Cleveland on, on the, a good process for selecting a, a committee to work with them on this equity initiative. And these are the, these are the members. Let me see if I can zoom in just a little bit um, of the committee. And you can see, uh, we'll, we'll probably post this on, on Facebook uh, here after this uh, meeting is over. But um, what we tried to do is to uh, have a diverse group of community members from, that have, who have different roles in the community. Um, we even have two students from Paducah Tillman on this list, and we're really happy to welcome them, uh, Dana Hernandez and Jacoby Isbell. And uh, so uh, we also have an ex officio member, Teresa Spann, who chairs our staff diversity committee. And so we wanted her to be able to just be aware of what, what the, what the, um, how the audit is going, what the committee members um, are discussing. And so uh, there are gonna be plenty of opportunities moving forward for um, other people in the community to get involved in this process. Uh, this is, you know, this is just the beginning of what is what I expect to be a, a, a fairly long and ongoing process. Um, so there should be plenty of opportunity to be part of this um, if you're interested. All right. And so now I want to introduce our, uh, our experts who are really uh, here to help us um, make Paducah schools a more uh, equitable uh, uh, school district. And I want to start with uh, uh, Dr. Greg Vincent. Um, Dr. Uh, Vincent is a, is a national expert on civil rights, um, social justice, and campus culture. Um, he served as vice president for diversity and community engagement at University of Texas at Austin. He was the 48th grandsire archon of Sigma Pi Phi fraternity. He also served as the president of both Hobart College and William Smith College. Dr. Vincent was named the 2016 Educator of the Year by University of Pennsylvania and received the Ohio State University Mortis College of Law Distinguished Service Award in 2012. He currently serves as Executive Director of the Civil Rights and Education Initiative and Professor at the University of Kentucky. And I'm gonna just turn it over to you, Dr. Vincent, to introduce our, 
our uh, the the overall structure of the audit and, and what what your role will be at University of Kentucky. Yeah. Super, Superintendent Black, thank you for that very gracious introduction. And, and, and moreover, thank you for um, being the convener of this very important work. I've really enjoyed getting a chance to meet with you and the team. And I can tell you that, um, um, that your commitment definitely uh, comes, um, comes through. And I wanna uh, thank the, uh, the opportunity to work with, with Drs. Cleveland and, and Aikens as, as we uh, assist uh, the Paducah community uh, in this work. And I know that um, uh, with this and working together, we can address some of these issues. You know, I have to start with kind of a macro context because I think it's so critical. Um, you know, we often talk about school districts being kind of the center of a community, right? It, you know, and, you know, you have elected officials, you have teachers who often live in the community. It is the place uh, where we develop the next generation of citizens who will contribute to our democratic society. And I'm often reminded and want to share that um, the Brown versus Board of Education decision that was rendered in 1954 said two things. One, of course, it explicitly um, um, overturned Plessy versus Ferguson and state-sponsored segregation in schools. But it went on to say something, you know, something very, uh, profound. It said that perhaps the most important function of local and state government is education, that it's really uh, the, the foundation of good citizenship, and no child should be expected to fully participate in our democratic society without an education. And so for me, if we're talking about the Paducah community, one of the most important things that we can do is one, of course, keep people safe, keep people healthy and educate them so that they can fully participate uh, in this, 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 this experiment called democracy. I, I say that, and I don't need to remind anyone, but I say it because we saw just a few weeks ago how close we came to devolving into something that I, I, um, I never thought would happen. No, despite our disagreements, I thought that we would never see our hallmark of democracy be under attack. I bring that up because we have to turn the heat down as far as the rhetoric, as far as the, uh, as the way we interact with one another. I never said don't back down from accountability, right? You have to hold your, your school board members, your leaders, your teachers, your administrators accountable. That's different than, okay, we can't, eat, we can't even come together. And so I applaud the Paducah community for coming together to address this critical issue around race and equity. We know that these issues are not controversial except that they've become politicized. And just to name a couple of facts, the American Medical Association has um, announced that racism is a public health crisis. That is, that is not in dispute. We also know the power of diversity. We know and is through, through great research that students that learn in a diverse learning environment have better outcomes than, than students that live in a segregated environment. And so there's so much that we can do. And so when we talk about diversity and when we talk about equity and racial justice, what we're really talking about is community, right? How can we come together and put aside our artificial differences to make Paducah uh, the, the destination place, pay, a place for young people to, to live. I applaud the two student members um, and uh, for to attract new people. And so that, that's kind of the macro points that I wanted to, to make. Getting down to the plan um, is exactly what has been laid out, which is uh, we're doing an equity audit. And one of the things that becomes really important because people often interchange equity and equality. 
I really applaud the school district, you know, Will, for you, your team, for really talking about equity. Because what we're really talking about is how eventually everyone can get that education that the Supreme Court um, demanded in the Brown decision. And how can we do that in an equitable way? If we keep doing things, even with the systemic issues, equally, we're never going to get there. So how do we do that in equi you know, um, equitably wrapped in justice, transparency, and accountability? So it's our hope that we can help with that effort. And so for us, we see three parts to this initial work. And then, you know, um, I was a decent relay uh, runner, you know, do a smooth handoff uh, to my esteemed colleagues so that they can continue this work, but always be involved and present. So the first uh, part of the, the, the phase is to conduct an equity audit, a comprehensive and objective look based on best practices about what's going on, what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportuni um, uh, opportunities, um, uh, and tasks that we can take on that will help um, Paducah move forward. And then with that, kind of develop an action plan. I'm, I think it's so important to do this. Um, I'm reminded that not just too long ago, a couple of weeks ago, we honor the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, and he talked about the fierce urgency of now. So when we talk about action plans, we're talking about the work that we need to do right now. We don't have the luxury of waiting. We have to do that now. And if that was you know, true 58 years ago, it's true today. And then two, you know, taking on um, this the opportunity to implement um, I, I'm, I'm reminded by a mentor when they say a training plan, he, didn't, he never liked the word training because he said you train monkeys, um, but um, I, I would say an education plan. So we can alter that well uh, to address growth areas and, and opportunities. And again, put that in there because we all can learn. We all can develop. You know, I constantly uh, work on this. I know doctors uh, Aikens and Cleveland, they do the same thing. We're all always educating ourselves and no matter where you are, we can um, help you uh, uh, do this work. And then of course, part of this, and we're doing this at the local level, state, regional, and national level, we need to review policy to make sure that it's being administered in an equi equitable way. And then finally, um, I think it's important that we implement and develop a minority recruitment plan. And I know Dr. Cleveland does this. He, you know, he is truly a, a national expert uh, on this issue of mentoring, particularly young men. And one of the things that I know we both do and, and, and is encourage young men to go into teaching, right? And I think that's something that we are looking to do. And so we do want to you know, get um, more young men, particularly young men of color, you know, into teaching because they, we think we can make a difference. Let me stop there so that, um, that I can turn over Back to you, uh, Superintendent Black, and we can um, hear from the other distinguished um, uh, members of the team. All right, great. Well, I do want to I want to introduce uh, Roger Cleveland next. Uh, Dr. Cleveland is uh, Director of Faculty Diversity and Development at Eastern Kentucky University. Um, he uh, has taught um, at Moorhead State University, University of Kentucky, Middle Tennessee State and Kentucky State University. In 2013, Dr. Cleveland received the PG Peebles Equity and Excellence Achievement Award from the Fayette County Equity Council for his work in improving local schools. In 2014, uh, he was inducted into the Kentucky Civil Rights Hall of Fame. Uh, Dr. Cleveland is the Associate Director of the Nationally Recognized Black Males Working or BMW Academy program in Lexington, Kentucky. And he is the president and owner of Millennium Learning Concepts Educational Consulting Company. Um, and, and with Dr. Cleveland, I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Uh, Roz Akins. Uh, she has, uh, Dr. Akins has served as an educator in the Fayette County School System for over 30 years as a teacher at uh, Leestown Middle School and Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School. She's also served as the Dean of Students at Leestown Middle School and Carter G. Woodson Academy. She was selected Middle School Teacher of the Year by the Fayette County Public School System. Um, and recently, uh, Dr. Akins received the Social Entrepreneur Award from the Lexington Leadership Foundation. In 2005, Dr. Akins founded the Black Males Working 
or BMW Academy. And now the BMW Academy has four sites and serves over 325 young men in kindergarten through 12th grade. Dr. Akins is also the founder of Carter G. Woodson Academy in Lexington. And so I'm gonna turn it over first to Dr. Uh, Cleveland. Um, it, and we, we're really excited that, that uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Vincent and Dr. Cleveland and Dr. Akins are, are up for working together on this uh, equity audit and, this, uh, and our action planning that's gonna occur after the audit. Um, very excited about um, learning more uh, from Dr. Cleveland and Dr. Akins um, in terms of what they did in Lexington uh, with the BMW Academy, um, as well as um, how we might better align our local resources um, to serve our students of color more effectively. Uh, we, we really, we, I know we have a lot to learn. Uh, we, we actually have visited uh, Dr. Cleveland and Dr. Akins, Dr. Shively and I actually went up about two uh, years ago almost, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a year and a half ago. I, and we had a we had a wonderful time uh, learning from them um, about all their efforts. So, Dr. Cleveland, I'd love to turn it over to you next. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, um, Will. I appreciate the uh, invite, and good to see you, uh, Dr. Vincent. And I just want to start out saying that um, what Dr. Vincent mentioned about community is critical, and the work that he's going to do prior to us coming in is, is laying a foundation and giving a baseline of where Paducah Independent Schools is and a reference to equity and on top of that racial equity also. And so the, the findings that a report he's going to present to us really is going to be important because our kind of role is this, is he mentioned community and we want the school district and the community working together, right? And so based on some of the findings that uh, his team is going to uh, provide for us is when we're going to bring about the, this committee and then the entirety, a larger community about, so what does this look like moving forward? Because he's gonna give us the baseline, the real work uh, once he gets this done is you know between the district and the community. So we're gonna facilitate some um, forums so people can um, give their perspective on not only what the audit bears out, but also uh, things in general. And so that's gonna be really important. And the community is critical in getting this work done. I've always believed that no school district is gonna be successful without the, the, the broader community. It just, it just doesn't happen. And, uh, and so, you know, there's a quote that says that a child only educated at school is an uneducated child, which means you know, home and the community is critical in ensuring that the child's successful. That don't mean the schools are not accountable and responsible for educating the child, but you have to have something in the community. So we're gonna, we're gonna have um, several forums for uh, the larger community to not only just, you know, constantly focus on the problems, but we're gonna focus on solutions. And, and so how we can get those um, solution, solutions and, and thoughts aligned with, um, the report that Dr. Vincent is going to provide us. And so we're gonna, we're gonna listen to a lot of listening. And uh, someone told me a long time ago that you're gonna be successful, you listen, learn, then lead. And so uh, we're gonna listen first, but our focus is gonna be about um, solutions and strategies and how the, the broader community and the school district can work together. And we're going to, we're gonna flesh out issues around equity and racial equity and make sure that race is not a barrier for students being successful uh, in the school district. The second part um, is uh, a lot of work, but fun work. And I'll let Ross talk a little bit about that. You mentioned it, uh, Will, about uh, BMW Academy. And that's basically where we're mentoring and have a mentoring program with a focus on leadership and academics uh, for young men of color. And so the, our first part is really bringing about the community this committee, larger community, and having sessions where we listen and then figure out how ways we can make sure that uh, their voice is included into the work uh, of the district, uh, which is critical. And then the second part is how we can um, somehow, if we haven't had a program, a mentoring program, systemically, 
but because we've been around the state quite a bit and we've seen a lot of different programs they start and they're not sustained they may have a year or two or whatever we're, we're, we're in our 16th year are working with young men of color and you can go around the country and you won't find it you'll see a lot of programs here and there and dr vincent probably can tell you he's been in a number of different places but that's that's a rarity and, and so but it takes a commitment and we have a strong strong relationship with our our school district and we have a strong strong relationship with the university of kentucky and so i'm gonna let Roz talk a little bit more about um those two pieces so our part is around bringing uh bringing some synergy around the school district and the community uh, to address student achievement, which is critical. And then the second part is starting a program for specifically for males of color uh, within the school district and also in the community. Uh, Roz. All right, thanks, Dr. Cleveland. Will, thank you so very much for having us this evening and to Dr. Ben, we are excited and looking forward uh, to working with the Paducah community and the school family there. I was blessed to come there a couple of years ago um, at the request of some faith-based leaders to talk about some of the things we were doing in Fayette County to make a difference um, in the lives of young men of color as well as all students. And um, I did an in-depth study of um, the scores, the MAP scores and the test scores, uh, the K-PREP scores of students in the uh, Paducah school system in preparation for coming for that presentation. And um, I, I think that's one of the things we're gonna have to do is be very realistic. We're gonna have to have those difficult conversations because when it comes to the academic achievement gap, there is not only a gap, there's a gorge when it comes to some students. And so we are excited to come and help um, this school system, because if one kid is successful, we want every child to be successful, no matter what their race, no matter their ethnicity, no matter their socioeconomics, all of those factors play in and having a strong school system. And as Dr. Cleveland said, it's gotta be a strong uh, commitment on behalf of the school, uh, the community at large, and also the faith-based community and other nonprofit folks that you have there. Uh, and so what we did, and listen, you gotta be creative and out of the box if you're gonna deal with racial equity. If you keep doing the same old things, you're gonna get the same results. And I think somebody far wiser than I said, that's called stupidity. And so uh, you've gotta be willing to have those difficult conversations. You're gonna have to be willing to be creative and out of the box uh, in order to make a difference. And I, I truly believe that you're there now and you're ready to make those changes. So what we did to address racial equity in our community 16 years ago, as Dr. Cleveland said, uh, the gorge for us in our school system was African-American males. It was identified uh, through the data. And so we started a Saturday program with 40 boys and it was Dr. Cleveland, myself, and another young lady, just the three of us. And we called this program BMW for Black Males Working because we had this desire and our mission is to educate, motivate, and to activate the potential for excellence that lies within every young man. What we found out, it was in them. They just needed to meet the right people to be able to get that potential out of them. And so that was 15 years ago. And we teach our young men the well principles there to be well-behaved, well-mannered, well-dressed, well-read, well-spoken, well-traveled, and all of that leads to them being well-prepared. And so 16, let's fast forward. We started with 40 boys 16 years ago. Today, we have 437 young men in grades kindergarten through 12th grade. We started with sixth through eighth grade and added a grade level every year. And so today, uh, we start, we have now 437 boys in kindergarten through uh, 12th grade. We are blessed to have uh, young men who have since graduated from college who are now coming back and giving back to this program. And uh, Will, you talked about uh, teachers. Uh, we talked about having programs to grow teachers. Uh, our, our two number one uh, student interns 
who work with BMW and who do a lot of work with us. Both of them are in education. So we're trying to grow our own teachers out of the BMW that will come back into the Fayette County public school system and give back. And so um, it's just being creative, being out of the box, being willing to roll up your sleeves and to get in there and to work. And so, as I said, we started out with three with the program. Today, we tap into fraternities, we tap into sororities, we tap into all kinds of organizations. And the fourth piece, you've got to have the support of your Chamber of Commerce. Our Chamber of Commerce helps us and identifies monetary, monetary resources that can help us with our program. And so those are some of the things that are the basics. If you get a strong, get the school system, the, the community, uh, the faith-based community and the Chamber of Commerce, there's nothing you all cannot do. And this equity will, will you know, uh, show you those things and you'll be able to make a difference in, your, in this community. And I'm looking forward to coming to help uh, you guys because I was excited two years ago and it kind of fell by the wayside, uh, but now it's been rekindled, revived and refreshed. And now let's just take it off and let's see the difference. It, well, do you mind if I just make a couple of, um, uh brief remarks uh, in response to Drs. Cleveland and Akins. First, wow, right? That's the first thing. What, what an amazing program to do this work for such a sustained period of time. So I applaud you both for this outstanding effort. There are two kind of um, frames that, that you share that I want to just emphasize. One is listening. One of the things we have to do, and, and if, you know, no matter what the substantive outcomes are, if we have a better capacity to listen to one another, you listen to our young people, listen to people who may have different views. I think that you can make great progress with that. The other thing that I loved about what Dr. Akins and, and Cleveland had to say was these constituent groups. Will, we talked about the need to reach out to the faith community, which you did. I love what Dr. Akins talked about with the business community. One of the things that we know is that you know, for business to thrive, to have great economic empowerment, you need to have a strong system. Businesses are attracted, whether they're small businesses or, or big businesses, to a strong economy, free of as much strife as possible. One of the reasons why Charlotte became such a great city was because they integrated their schools at the county level, at the Mecklenburg school level, right? They, they talked about that, so that's A. And then, and then Atlanta, right, adopted that, that slogan, a city too busy to hate, right? Now, no city is perfect, but it, it gives an example of how when business community, the faith community all come together, it's really powerful. So again, I wanna thank Dr. Akins and Dr. Cleveland for um, taking those concepts and in applying them for 16 years. Can we just take a moment, 16 years? That, you know, a lot of folks, you know, fold up because it's hard work, right? Um, yeah. But for 16 years, that's pretty awesome. So again, great. Congratulations. All right. Thanks, uh, Dr. Vincent and uh, Dr. Cleveland, Dr. Akins. I really appreciate um, and are excited about what you're getting ready to uh, offer us as a community. Um, I think at this time, um, if it's okay with you all, I'd like to um, allow uh, people to ask questions uh, to the panel here um, through the chat. Uh, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can here. Um, if, if you just go toward the bottom of your screen to the chat, um, you should be able to um, type a question in and then we will do our best to, to answer that. Uh, and I may, if it's depending on uh, what the question is directed or what the subject of the question is, we may direct it to one or more of the panelists. So I'll just give it a chance for people to ask. Well, I don't see any questions. Oh, here's one. All right, um, we have a question from uh, Ann Bidwell. Uh, can you detail a few of the key components of the audit? Uh, what sort of data will you mine beyond achievements and test scores? Um, for example, will you look into disciplinary measures? 
Dr. Vincent? Yes, ab absolutely. So we do plan to look at a comprehensive array of data and categories. You've outlined them. I think ach achievement is absolutely critical. Are black students and other students achieving at the right level? You know, we have to look at test scores. I have my own views about that, but I, I'm sure you do as well. So we certainly have to look at that. I, and, and you hit on one that's so very critical, which is the disciplinary you know, measures. We know that there's a disproportionate impact. I also think that um, you know, sus uh, you know, suspensions in particular, we know the impact that that will, that will have. Um, in addition uh, to, to that, you know, we're going to look at, you know, kind of mining down a little bit, participation in, you know, in advanced courses, as we know that those lead, you know, to more opportunities. Uh, we also will um, take a, we also will listen to students and parents. And I think that's something that is very important to kind of continue with the questions um, is, is timeline. Uh, it is our plan to move on to the audit in February, there's just some, in order to do this right, we wanna make sure that we are handling the questions because we're gonna be talking to young people. We wanna do that in a, in a way that makes some sense. We anticipate that that will take a, you know, just a couple of months to be able to do that work. We anticipate the entire project to kind of um, go through the late summer, early fall. So that, I hope that that's helpful. And I apologize if you can hear my wonder pets. Uh, they are, um, Evidently, that I'm sure there's some squirrel or something being delivered to the door. So I apologize for that. <laughs> no problem. Okay, thank you. Um, and so uh, we, I, I think you addressed a question about timeline. Um, the another question is how and when will community members have the opportunity to participate? About that. This is the start of that. We absolutely, and I shared this with Will, this can't work can't happen unless we hear from the community. I am interested in hearing, you know, again, all of the community members. I want to hear from parents. I want to hear from students, you know, the professionals that do this work, the members in the community, you know, essentially everyone, but with a particular emphasis on the folks who are directly involved and engaged right now. Um, I am very excited about hearing from students to hear what they have to say. Um, one of the things that I know Drs. Cleveland and, and Akins would endorse is that we have to empower our students uh, to, to, take, to take advantage of their education and not wait uh, for that. So I'm excited about hearing from them. Uh, obviously parents that, you know, that's so critical, you know, in that, you know, that enterprise. So, uh, you, you know, listening will be an essential part of uh, this work, which is why I wanted to amplify the points that Drs. Cleveland and Aikens made about listening. And this is the start of that. All right, thank you. Um, let me see, we have a question about um, how uh, will uh, you inform the community of your findings? We are going to issue a report that we expect to be, you know, public. You know, we are, and, and it's going to, uh, you know, th that it would be transparent. Because that was one of the other things we talked about with the board. That in order this, for this work to be credible, it has to be uh, done in a transparent way. Uh, so we do plan for our report to be made uh, made public. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, th there's a question about how do we recruit the parents um, on the committee? Um, and actually, in terms of, of recruiting um, everybody on the committee, there was a process um, through which we consulted with different community leaders, um, just garnering suggestions on potential com uh, committee members. And in the case of parents, we um, asked not only community uh, a few community members, but also we, we really um, asked principals as well as, uh, as teachers and instructional assistants. We also needed a balance in uh, between the schools as much as possible. Um, that's part of the reason why we, we ended up actually going over the, the number of community, um, or sorry, committee members that was suggested. It was 12 to 15, and I think we, 
we ended up with 19. Uh, but uh, we felt like uh, we, we got it down as, as small as we could get it. Uh, next question is, have you um, experienced working in communities where, where trust um, you know, has been compromised or uh, in other words, where there, there might be issues of trust around uh, within the community before you even start? A absolutely, and, and that is an unfortunate reality. And again, I, I know doctors Cleveland and Aikens would agree. I think, I, I think the thing that you have to do with that case is one, that's again, that same ingredient about listening, about, and, and then uh, taking that, that, the, um, that um, information and doing something with it, right? Um, I happen to, and again, I, you, know, you, you all know my history, you know, I, ha I lived in Baton Rouge, um, Louisiana, and, you know, and in Austin, I still, uh, still do virtually, um, but, it, but in, in, in Baton Rouge, they had not settled the initial Brown litigation when I was there in the late 90s, early, the early 2000s. And so there was a great deal of mistrust. I think the thing that we were able to do is to do exactly what Dr. Aiken said. You know, we work with community members. You know, we work there. The chamber played a huge role uh, in, in helping to address these issues and candidly doing a, a great deal of what we're doing right now. My role at that time uh, was to ensure that LSU was a, involved. You know, you talked about teachers and, and other educators and, and providing opportunities but then also providing good research. And that's the other thing that we'll do in this audit is that we'll connect these issues to good, reliable research and practice. Uh, here's another question. When audit, auditing policies, and I know uh, uh, Dr. Vincent, there is a uh, part of the audit is a policy review. Um, will we be looking at the Board of Education, um, you know, in terms of their practices and, and they're following bylaws? Yeah, you, you know, what a great question. And, <clears throat> you know, there's two parts of policy analysis. It is the actual policy itself. And I think it's always good to kind of review that. I think you need to do that as a matter of course. I think the bigger issue is how do you apply the, uh, the policies, right? So going back to suspensions and discipline, you know, I think every school district has, has that on the books. Right, but then how do you apply it? Do you apply it equitably, or does it adversely impact certain groups? You then can go a step further. What are some of the best? You know, what are some of the best strategies? Some of the things that we worked on in Austin with Title I schools was how do we employ, for example, restorative justice, um, reparative justice? Right? How do you? How, how do you how do you make that that happen? And I think that's a key key part. All right. Um, let's see. There's a question about um, would you agree in order to achieve success, it is imperative that mutual trust be established. And we kind of already addressed the issue of trust, but um, all parties must trust that everyone's working toward the betterment of students um, and ultimately the community. Anything else on that issue in terms of uh, from your all's perspective? I will only say that um, in reference to trust that uh, those who have uh, concerns with the district uh, from their past experience that you validate their experiences because um, uh, perception is reality. Mm -hmm. And so you validate those experiences um, and at the same do that and at the same time try to move forward, but don't, we can't avoid that step. You do have to, you know, validate people's experiences. They feel there's trust issues and things like that. Part of the work that Dr. Vincent is doing and then the report and looking at the policies, uh, pop, uh, potential policies uh, around equity. And then also, you know, one of the things I've done with schools before is that I helped them develop an equity scorecard. And so that's a, a a, a, a instrument where you can address transparency and whatever we say we're going to do, you know, that's everywhere. It's on the district website. Every school has it. The community can see it or whatever. And, and so that a little mistrust is still there. 
you still had that accountability piece there. But the first part is uh, validate people's experiences. All right, uh, next question is, how important is support of local government and how do you solicit that support? Um, and not, there's Dr. Vincent, he's coming back. Dr. Vincent, I'm sorry, let me, <laughs> let me read that again. The next question, how important is support of local government and how do you solicit that support? Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I um, paraphrase the Brown decision, right? Because you know the, you, the unanimous Supreme Court said perhaps the most important function of state and local government is education, right? So if you follow that 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 reasoning, I would say it's you know beyond the health and safety and, and welfare of your people, education is the next important thing and should be funded and attended to in that way. So I would say education is a critical part of this. I think one of the public policy disasters in our country is that we spend mo more money imprisoning our young people than actually educating them. And I think we have to find ways, if we're talking about policy uh, connection, we have to find a way to address that issue, not just in Paducah, but across the country. Let me, let me also add there, here in Lexington a few weeks ago, our mayor, established what she called was the Mayor's Commission on Racial Equity. And one of the categories that she wanted, and I was, I served as co-chair of that commission. And one of the main categories she wanted us to look at was education and economics. And, <clears throat> and the subcommittee came out of that with that there's got to be a great working relationship with the, the local government, as well as the, the public school system and all entities that have private daycares or church kindergartens or whatever, because if we're not teaching the same universal uh, kindergarten level of teaching, then that's why sometimes kids do not come to school prepared. And so that was something that our government, our local government looked at and has put a committee together to bring all these entities together to make sure everyone is teaching the same thing, whether they go to a private daycare I mean, a private kindergarten, public kindergarten or whatever. And so if we're all on the same page, so I think there's got to be a great working relationship between the government and the school system so that there will be a great school system because a great school system is a reflection of a good government. All right. Uh, the, the next question is, is, is one of the end goals to begin a program for males of color like BMW? I think if it comes, if the data comes out that there is a need for a program like this, and I've seen the data and there is a need for a program like this, that will be something that will be recommended. And if the community is willing to own that, there's no reason that the faith-based community and the parents and, and folks can come together and start a program like that, that will academically enhance the young men academically, socially, emotionally, and do all those things for young men of color. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Akins, you, you make such a great point. L let me share what I know about kind of next steps. Um, as you all know, in 2016, President Obama uh, initiated the My Brother's Keeper initiative out of the White House to provide um, uh, best practices on how around mentoring, particularly for young men and boys of color. Um, uh, now President Biden is committed to bringing that back and making that a White House initiative. And so I see uh, real activity in this area. And so our efforts really align with those national efforts uh, to help um, implement um, best practices around mentoring young, um, young men and boys of color. And let me just, let me also say, of course, uh, the same effort needs to happen for young women and girls. So I think right. but stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. and, and let me piggyback on that. The BMW Academy was recognized by the Obama Foundation 2018 as one of the most outstanding mentoring, mentoring programs in the nation. Yeah, I, and, and, uh, and, and I was, uh, if you weren't gonna say it, Dr. Akins, I was gonna, <laughs> I was definitely gonna share it. Um, and, um, and so we also had a, a, a program that was recognized as well. So I really do uh, um, think there's some great opportunities there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just mention something else about starting a, 
a program, I only advise, and Roz knows this, that uh, don't start it if you're not going to go, you know, the long haul. That's right. Uh, the last thing um, our students need is be people in and out um, and instability into that. And so I think I was talking to Will about a month and a half ago, and it may sound really um, strange to uh, possibly this committee, but I had said that I prefer you start a program outside of the school district and partner with the school district. Mm -hmm. And because we did that, we've had three superintendents and our program's still there because it started in the community, but we have a strong, strong, positive relationship with uh, the school district. And so if we you start something uh, that is not tied directly to the community, then, you know, we'll get the lottery and move to, uh, you know, Hawaii and other leadership in central office may be gone. Uh, and then someone else may come in and say, you know what, we don't need this program. But if it's, if it's in the community and anchored in the community, you can always partner with um, the leadership in the school district. And I don't know what school district is going to say we don't want to partner when you are working with the group, the group of students who are occupying a basement of achievement. So why would you not want to work with them? We never had a problem with Fayette County wanting to work with our with us and our students because they want the students to be successful also. So um, having a strong partnership between the community and school district when you start this is really critical. And it takes some work. I mean, you gotta be committed. You know, the, we need people in the communities really committed um, working with these young men and women. Um, here's, a, here's a question. Now, what other programs uh, do you have for other minority students? Or And I wonder if that's uh, minority groups uh, or, or is it all based on data representation? What if a group of students is underrepresented through the data? And, and specifically in our community, um, for instance, um, we have a smaller representation of or proportion of Hispanic students, but the Hispanic students make up about 10% of our, of our student population. So still a sizable group. We have other groups that are maybe one or 2%. Uh, what, what, how do we work for equity for, for all different uh, minority groups. Yeah, well, let, let, let me take a quick quick hit at that and then I'm gonna turn it over to, to, to my colleagues. Um, in my former, uh, well, earlier in my career, I worked in as a, as a civil rights attorney. And I bring that up to say that race remains the largest single category of discrimination. So race for so many reasons matter. At the same time, there are other issues facing the community. So when you talk about civil rights and equity, there are other groups. You know, Justice Thurgood Marshall, though he was the greatest kind of legal advocate for, for, for racial justice, was just as keen about gender, persons with disabilities, ethnicities, and fought so hard for those issues. And so my very, you know, uh, my ending comment is, it's not either or, it's both and. And so for example, you know, the, the My Brother's Keeper not, was not just for um, Black um, young men and, and, and um, boys, but it was for all students who felt that they were underrepresented. I think socioeconomic status, particularly in a state like Kentucky, um, I think there's some, some issues there as well. And, and let, me, let me share with you that the BMW Academy, uh, we have Hispanic males, we have Caucasian males, uh, and when we started Carter G. Woodson, because parents are not as concerned about the race part, they are wanting what program you're offering that's gonna better my, my young man. And so they have bought in to what we're offering uh, their student with the tutoring, with the enrichment and all the different programs. It doesn't bother them at all that the majority of the students are African-American. So let me, let me go over to Carter G. Woodson now, which is the school part that BMW gave birth to. Carter G. Woodson is probably 10% uh, Hispanic and we're probably 3% Caucasian now. And here's what's interesting. I got a call that we have a big uh, Martin Luther King uh, Day that one of the fraternity sponsors and um, they have an essay contest and I mean, every year, it's always an Asian student who wins it or a student that goes to a gifted uh, program at a school 
Well, I got the call this year that finally a kid from Carter G. Woodson Academy won first place and won the scholarship, one of our sixth graders. We were so excited, but guess what? It was one of our Caucasian students that won. And so his parents have him in the program. They don't miss a beat and they, they just appreciate all the programs and what we offer their young men uh, to, be better young, to be better young men and all the exposure. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, one more question here. How many communities uh, have you or are you working in? I Cleveland, I'll let you shoot with that, then I'll come next. Are you, are they referring to um, this kind of work or in general? I guess I'm trying to, uh, because that could be, <laughs> that yeah. could be from yeah. Texas to Virginia. Uh, in Kentucky, actually, you know, I guess, you know, you can't be a prophet in your own land. So that's probably 90% of my work is probably in larger districts in other states. But to answer that question, how many and have uh, hundreds, you know, yeah. I've been in this game for a while. So I've been working with a lot of, uh, uh, oh, she said this kind of work with racial equity, uh, probably about 10 or 11 different districts, most of them outside of Kentucky, but I've done a lot of, you know, Jefferson County is probably the leading district in dealing with racial equity right now. And so I, I was working with them from, kind of day one when they developed their racial equity policy four or five years ago, they have a racial equity plan. They have a racial equity scorecard. Every school has to do a racial equity uh, plan. So uh, in Kentucky, probably about four or five districts, but very few districts are actually dealing with racial equity, very few. For me, I am working with four other school districts but with, with very consistent, uh, consistent work. So that's what, we're, that's what we're doing. And I have a team of other faculty um, as well as um, a staff and, and graduate students. And right now I'm only working with one other school district. Yeah, and over time, you know, I probably, you know, worked with 50 to 100 school districts. That's probably about the same with uh, over time, probably about the same as Dr. Vincent. Like I said, a lot of them are, uh, a lot of districts outside of Kentucky, but you know, some of Kentucky, Warren County, Covington, uh, Jefferson County, Fayette. So, but over time, quite a few districts, you know. We're not new at this, if you can say that. <laughs> well, there's definitely a lot that we can learn. Uh, I really appreciate um, your your time uh, to all the panelists here. Um, thank you also to everyone attending um, out there. Uh, if you have more questions, would really I would uh, love to hear from you um, uh, via email. Uh, and uh, we are getting excited about getting started here. So we will uh, continue to update uh, the community on our on our efforts through our website and through Facebook. Um, we will um, be, we actually are starting, we're creating a section for racial equity on our, on our website where we can update the work of the, you know, how the committee is going, how the audit is going, how the um, uh, policy review, and then, then the action planning. Uh, so we will, we'll, we'll be uh, trying to communicate on a regular basis. And, and again, if you have any questions, please reach out to us. Any other comments from the, from the panel? No, well, again, just thank you. And I'm so excited about working with uh, Drs. Cleveland and, and 